would you want to be a learner in your own classroom? That's a question I've been asking educators for years and trying to get them to really think about the student experience. The reason I bring this question up, and I think sometimes the misconception about this question is that, yeah, I would actually love the things that I'm doing in the classroom. I would actually love, you know, the way that I'm teaching right now or I'm leading and things like, and, you know, and you hear conversations like that. But when I talk about that, it's not about understanding teaching and learning and leading from your perspective. It's when I ask the question, would you want to be a learner in your own classroom? Part of it is actually understanding the learners you serve. Part of it is actually trying to understand their experiences, their wisdom, what they're bringing to the classroom, and then trying to understand that perspective of what learning looks like in the classroom. And I think this is at the heart of empathy in education. And I had this really great conversation with Naomi Tolan. She is an educator from Ireland who's moved all over the world. And we talk a lot about empathy. We talk a lot about her experiences traveling as an educator, which I find really interesting because she's traveled, you know, all over the world, seen different experiences so that she can really experience, um, you know, to see different viewpoints. But also we talk about anxiety and I actually share probably one of my most embarrassing stories I've ever taught, uh, told in the podcast, but it just kind of came up and it was interesting talking about, to be honest with you, my own anxiety and some of the stuff that I deal with and some of the things that kind of just came to my mind when I was sharing, uh, when we were having our conversation. So we had a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Hey everyone, this is the Innovators Mindset Podcast, and today I got a good friend of mine and very special guest, Naomi Tolan, uh, who is actually, we're recording this on a Friday, it's Saturday morning, she is in Japan right now, and I connected with Naomi over the last year, and it's really interesting, we had a podcast together, I was on her podcast uh, earlier in the year, and actually she got me more interested uh, in kind of doing podcasting, having, and I think not necessarily podcasting, but having conversations on the podcast. Cause I was just kind of talking to myself. And so we, we did, uh, we did a podcast together and then we had an awesome opportunity to like connect and not only connect with each other, but through her, she connected a bunch of people that, um, was just awesome and, and very kind of, uh, innovative and actually when you first came to the idea I'm like why well, I, I don't understand what you're doing and then I saw I was like oh this is actually like such a great idea so uh, we've been talking before a little bit of podcasting and I'm gonna like have like a little funny theme song for you at, before you introduce yourself <laughs> do you know that do you know that like internet internet meme song meme? yeah 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 <laughs> and he go, it goes on and on and on and he's like <laughs> yeah there, there's like a super long video so hey thanks for being on the podcast thanks for doing this first thing in the morning so can you just tell a little bit about who you are and, and what you do in your experience in education thank you so much for that introduction that's really kind to hear that like yeah that's empathetic educators has been like oh i've just been so part of it i've just been i thought so you were thanking part. me for the awesome song <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thanks a lot, Spencer, and the <laughs> la la la. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, like I said, I love empathetic educators. It's just been, I've just been so proud and so excited about where it's gone last year. And our conversation was actually at the very start of COVID last year. And um, everything, a lot's changed since then. Yeah. And um, But you were actually the first live show for empathetic educators. And I was, yeah, so proud of how all the connections have happened. So yeah, hello, I'm Naomi Toland and I am originally from Ireland, taught in London for three years, then New Zealand for three years, and now I'm living in Japan and I'm just all about connections. Like you said, like I, I feed off people and like, mm-hmm. like the energy and like the, the amazingness. And I think what I've loved, I always thought that it had to be in-person energy, but I just love, like you say, like the live connection. Right. My parents were like, do you know each other like in person? Like, do you all know each other all connected? But some people only met each other online mm-hmm. that, that first day. And I've really, really enjoyed just seeing how, what virtual relationships look like and what physical ver- like relationships right. look like and how they can be joined together. Because like you say, I feel like I've connected with people online over the past year. And I do feel like I, I know them a mm-hmm. little bit. I, I always used to look at the like, digital dating or like things like that and how can you know someone that deeply online Mm -hmm. 
and I think it goes hand in hand. Like you, I obviously would love to meet in person one day and yep. like and have those connections and have it both together. But for me, I just love connecting. I love the human experience, and like I feel like that's such a big, big part of our evolution and like where we've come from. And I love that drive of me connect with other people, but then also helping other people connect with themselves too. So, yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that you do and was a reminder of like why I started kind of doing this connection online is that there is an opportunity to connect with people that are not, I don't know, necessarily like-minded because I know that we have different thoughts on different things, but probably like goal-minded, like we have similar goals, right? Uh, of what we want to achieve in our work and education and what we want to do. And I think sometimes that when you're in your physical spaces and you're limited to like just the, the community that you're in, sometimes it's harder to find those people. And it's not that we shouldn't like look to our communities, but I think for me, when I started off as a principal, I was very young and I felt that I have a diff- had a different vision of what that could be than some of the peers I was working with at that time and then i connect online and then i was like okay other people are doing this like i'm not just a crazy person uh doing this too right i actually got like i got the theme song because for like your empathetic educators was like epic so you get the let's see you get this one no 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 i <laughs> know the x files one you get this one that's a very special one for me i should be your empathetic educators i love that song so much <laughs> if you're comparing empathetic educators to that, I'm very happy. That's good... <laughs> it's epic, right? It should be like empathetic, epic, right? Educators, because I just loved it. But hey, this is, you know, you were kind of saying this too. Um, I want like, when I, there is a lot of people that I've connected with online so much that I don't even know if I've met them in person anymore. Like when you meet them, you're like, have we met before? Like, yeah. have we actually sat? Because it feels like you have. But you, because you, you're just so used to them, or like you're so used to them and comfortable with them. Like, is that crazy that I'm saying that? Or is that like, do, do you ever that's have that experience? Why, but that's also why I'm so passionate about technology and like exactly like you are as well. I think mm. people can look at technology and say, oh, they're just in this dark room and that's all the connection that they have. And yes, I agree that um, the other side of me, me is well being, technology and well being, yeah. and trying to get a balance. But I have seen. I was probably a person before this all happened, especially with COVID, that probably looked at online dating and said, how could you possibly have that mm-hmm. type of connection with someone and really get to know them? But I, 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 I am on the side now of you can get really, really good relationships, but it takes authenticity and honesty on both sides. I think that's what the difference is. If you're not right. being your true self, and I think I've seen people who I don't feel are being the true self, but also I've seen people who are being the true self that mm-hmm. like all you can do is see that. But I think all, honesty and authenticity online, that comes through mm-hmm. um, for a lot of people. And so like, that's where I see that I'm so passionate about trying to get that educa- into education and help our learners be authentic and honest. Right. And then what, that what can be achieved with that is, is amazing. So yeah, I, 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 I don't think it's crazy. Maybe, maybe we're all crazy. And, yeah. And then, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, like, it's actually funny about that you mention kind of like online dating and stuff like that because I, I like I've done this before. I've asked like groups because we're talking about this, and I actually think I know like to say like, oh, there's like some pauses coming out of COVID. One of the things that I've seen is like, hey, this is actually something I've been preaching for a long time, and I think people are starting to understand it. Is I've always people I've always been an advocate of people using technology to build connection, right? and seeing how powerful that is. And there's a lot of pushback because they're focused more on the technology stuff. And then I think a lot of educators, when they only have that, like they need a technology to connect with a relationship. Now they're kind of seeing that value on the other side of it too, right? But the, the thing that when you think about online dating, I always ask this question and I'll say like, hey, who in this room like met their significant other through like an online dating app? And it's like, oh yeah, I did, right? And then I say, just so you know, like 10 years ago, nobody would admit that you might have done it, but it was like, you would say, Hey, uh, like, let's not tell people we're online, like met online. Cause that's super weird. Like, let's tell them we met, you know, somewhere safe, like a bar. Right. And it was like, that was, that was like the standard. Right. And now people are just comfortable with it. And I think that's, that's really powerful. So 
when you're when you're looking at uh, your your podcast, Empathetic Educators, tell us a little bit about that process and what you're doing. So, um, in my first year, I think we talked about that as well. In my first year, I went probably on the, the edge of crazy. Like I was definitely like just on hinging and on hinging every day because I was living this life, but then inside of my head. I, it wasn't the same thing. Like it wasn't, I was trying to put on this facade of I'm okay. Mm-hmm. But inside I just wasn't coping with all the, I was like an inner, inner, London, inner city London school. And there was just so many things that came along with that. And I was growing up as tw- a 21 year old and myself, but also helping other learners mm-hmm. grow up as well as having parents help their learners grow up and just having all these different relationships. And I wasn't given time to myself at all. So I was just draining constantly on empty and i realized that what what's going on this isn't my normal state this i'm normally this full of energy able to cope with stuff life and it made me look into why why what's going on for me and that got me on the path of neuroscience um and psychology so trying to understand what's going on for someone and as well as that i was a very big empath so i did not know what the word empath was Mm -hmm. i was like people were i was just saying to people that I just feel the feels of all my learners. I'm just taking all this on. And one of the things I really remember is being at a concert with my partner and just breaking down. Like I just, I was on my weekend. So I was like able to, I should have been able just to close the door and keep the week away, but enjoy my weekend. But though that that's not, that's not able, we're not able just to close the door from Mm -hmm. all those feelings of all those learners. And that's whenever people were saying to me, you're quite an empath. And I was, I looked into the word empath. What does that mean? What is, what are these things? And then that got me into empathetic educators because I think empathy is important, but not at the detriment of ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I was wearing all those experiences those learners were having. I was wearing all my own experiences. I was wearing the experience of everyone. And that's what the draining part was happening. So I'm really I'm really passionate about empathy, but empathy not at the expense of ourselves. So it's like mm-hmm. a, it's it's both those streets. So what I'm trying to do now with empathetic educators is bringing people from all around the world to talk about their experiences but also trying to look at the the research of neuroscience and see what does that mean for us and looking at the facts of what's going on inside of us, what's going on inside of our learners to be able to then take action because of that as well. So yeah, it's a lot of little, little things coming together. But my main mission is I feel the more that we can understand ourselves and the more we can understand people in front of us, that will help us actually meet those people where they are and meet mm-hmm. ourselves where we are. And then go from there. So that's, yeah, that's kind of my mission, the overall goal. There, there's something like I, I have learned cause I can, and I don't know if this is even connected to this. Right. So one of the reasons I hate seeing like needles going into somebody, right. I hate seeing blood, things like that. Cause whenever I see it, I can physically feel it. Right. And I, that's what I really struggle with. And so I don't know if that's like what you say is an empath, right. Like that would kind of like, that's part of it too. And when you're talking, I was thinking about, I remember watching like a sports show and they were talking about, I can't remember the baseball player, but he was going through some controversy, but he was just like playing the best baseball of his life. And a lot of people can't have, you know, some personal problems and do well at this. And they were saying that his about like he has this amazing ability to compartmentalize, right? Like to be focused on that experience and nothing else is like going into his mind. And I think part of it too, the reason I bring this up is I found that I've, I've been better to deal with some stress in education when I find things that I can, I can actually totally tune out of education. Like I can take a break and I'm not thinking about those things, right? Like when I run on a treadmill, I can totally just focus and nothing else is in my mind other than, uh, you know, nothing education wise. Like I might get some ideas there, but I, that's my time to like, just focus on me. And I think that's helped quite a bit. So I don't know if that's something like if that connects to what you're talking about. Cause I think that's part of it too, is I, I try to find things that tune me out. But also like, I think that's just you, like, I think we mentioned before about being a teacher, it isn't just you're the teacher and that's all you are like whenever mm-hmm. you're in front of your learners there's so much more going on for ourselves and i think sometimes what i did at the very start was i'm a teacher that's mm-hmm. that's that's what i do and this idea of a teacher was very much like you're in front of the learners and you're you're in charge of them like you're responsible for them and yes we are responsible for them but yep. that's not all we are and i think 
I, I the idea of going to like do sports and going to like yeah. take your mind off it that's part of who you are as well and sometimes I feel like we almost feel guilty to have that side of us because we have to be trying to care for that and that, that again goes back to empathy because we're trying to do all this stuff for, mm-hmm. for our learners but yeah they're both sides so, yeah. and that, that like I know this I know this is probably gonna sound bad but I love doing this podcast I love doing this I love talking education and then people say to me like hey what podcast do you listen to in education I'm like I don't listen to any right and it's not because I don't like love education but sometimes I'm like, hey, that when I am on my phone and I listen to podcasts, I want to listen to some sports stuff. Like I want to listen to stuff that has nothing to do with this so I can get away from these things. And I think part of that process is me getting away helps me become better. And it actually, um, sometimes when I get away from it, I think we when we are so mired in a situation, like when we are so in the middle of it, we don't kind of realize it. Like I, I kind of liken to this. Sometimes I probably everyone listening it was like in a terrible relationship and didn't realize it was terrible until they left it. Do you know what I mean? Because then now you're out of it and you're look, it's almost like you're looking out of body. And so I try to create those experiences where I'm like, Hey, I need this time away so I can actually, you know, just get away from it and maybe see things from a different perspective. So I think that, that sorry, go ahead. Like that, the idea of like both that that's actually important for us to teach our learners mm-hmm. as well because like the, our brain needs that going back into the neuroscience yeah. part of it like our brain actually needs like that focused mode and um, i really like my like talking to barbara oakley about this she really made it clear of focus mode means that we're really concentrating on the, the idea at hand but then diffuse mode i find whenever i'm out running or whenever i'm out like doing the fun stuff that i like like the other side of me that's whenever I sometimes come up with my most creative ideas. Like me being on, I've taken a full month off since our live session. Mm-hmm. I've taken a full month off and haven't had any goals to achieve like over Christmas. Mm-hmm. And the amount of creative ideas that have been, been connecting the dots of last yep. year by me just going out for a walk and like in Japan or enjoying some things and be like, wow, this connects with education. I can bring this into education. Mm-hmm. And so like my brain isn't completely switched off as I'm like, I'm never going to think about the education part, but whenever it's less focused, it can make all those connections of the dots. And then I can be an even better teacher going back into the focus mode then as well. So, yeah. They, that, that point. So because my work is like with schools and districts, so my, my year is probably my busiest time of the year is when uh, teachers have summer break, right? And it's, you know, like I'm doing conferences in July and August uh, because states, you know, open at different spaces. And I used to like basically just January to like January 1st to end of December. And now I've really tried to say like, okay, hey, I need like some time away from this stuff so I can refresh my ideas so I can try some new things. So I just love that. So I got to ask you this, um, because I know people are listening and I get this question a lot and you would know this from experience. So you have traveled like country to country teaching in different schools. And I, I don't know if I could do that. Like I, I travel a lot and I hate traveling. Like it's and like, I, I'll tell you, and maybe this is horrible to say, I like, I, as someone who traveled all the time, people ask me like, Hey, do you miss, miss speaking? I'm like, I, I miss I miss speaking in person. I do not miss traveling at all, right? But you have gone from like country to country to country, and so tell us about that experience. Like, how has that been for you? And you know, like you were when when we first met, where were you were in New Zealand when we met, and then you're like, oh, I'm in like, you know, I'm in Tokyo now. I'm like, what? Like, I swear you're in. You're the only person in the world that moved during COVID, by the COVID. way. <laughs> I don't know, I know if you get in trouble for saying that, but so what's that, what's that been like? Like, what's that been like uh, going to, from like totally different countries? I, so I think it comes with, I love traveling. Like traveling's always been just like a big, big part of me. Like mm-hmm. I'm from Ireland, obviously. And like people always say about the Irish with the caravans and I love it. I love caravans. I love caravan holidays mm-hmm. where my family is to always just travel around Ireland, get your backpack and get on with it. And let's see what the day, what the day goes. I think that's kind of my approach to life is let's see how it goes. Let's see how the day goes. Let's see what, what the day can bring. And traveling for me across all the different parts, I think comes back to empathy. I really, really wanted to feel what it's like to be in London and teach. That was always right. a dream for me to like be in London. Mm-hmm. And then I wanted to see what it was like somewhere else. 
as well as just experience it personally and professionally i wanted to see because you can look online you can like but that's not the truth you don't know if that's the truth or not and right. for me i wanted to go and experience and live in someone else's shoes and see what what they see the world why do they the kiwis see the world the way they do is mm -hmm. it different from where where we've been and me and my partner said that we've only really lived in similar countries before so we we traveled around south america and that was a great experience for three months and we were able to live their type of life and see what they do and why they why they love dancing why they love their mm -hmm. different types of foods and then we wanted to challenge ourselves. I think it comes back to challenge. So as part of Empathetic Educators, there's six pillars for me. And I've through my research, it's just really come down to growth, relationships, accountability, systems, challenge, and perspective. And that's like the six pillars I really, really are just really honing in on like the past couple of past couple of months. And I think this element of challenge is really important for me personally. And I mm -hmm. think it's really important for us to have. I love being in New Zealand. I love being in Japan. I love being in London and seeing all those things, but it doesn't come without challenges, like being away from home, like experiencing right. all those things. I've had 10 years now where I haven't lived with my parents. And that's, I don't know if you've seen like my blog posts I've been putting out every week. It's like dear mommy and daddy, mm. because I want to dedicate that time that I've like, the experience that I'm having. I talk to them on like the phone and things like that, but I want to dedicate a bit of time to them because I want to bring them on the journey and that's like the downside to it is being away right. from home and me growing up away from home but again it comes back to digital relationships so mm. i've i've now intentionally been like contacting them every week and letting them know how my week goes writing those blog posts and letting them know how it goes so i think for me i love traveling and i i, I love it i think it brings such a big perspective that i can now say i know what japanese people do in japan and i've experienced their mm. life and i've walked in their shoes and i can i can personally critique it and that's my journey for me. I want to personally critique or personally have an awareness in my head right. and say, oh, that's what they do. And I, it's changed my perspectives. Again, the last part is perspectives for empathetic educators. Mm -hmm. And it's changed my perspectives of what I thought Japan would be like versus what it right. actually is like in my shoes being there. So, yeah, I think that's there's a there's a big, big part of what travel and does to a person. Like you said, I think I listened to your podcast um, with Shane. I think you said yeah. it is. Ed, yeah. Ed, um, and you're mentioning that you've had such a better relationship with your family being being back at home and being in there rather than traveling for 30 days, yeah. 300 days throughout yeah. the year. So there's pros and cons to it. Like there's there's yeah. always pros and cons. And I think if there was ever more more cons than pros, then I would have to reevaluate traveling throughout the world. But for me, it just brings so much, so much excitement in my life doing what I'm doing. So. Yeah. And he actually, he kind of, I think he was kind of caught off guard when he asked me, he's like, so like, what do you focus on? I'm like being a dad. And I think he was kind of like thrown off by that because it was, you know, I, th I think a lot of times people see like, oh, this, you have this experience and they kind of glamorize it. I'm like, well, it's not really, you know, like a lot of times I remember uh, I went to Australia for uh, a few weeks to do like a speaking tour and okay. and people might not understand this even when I tell the story it was like I'd speak all day we'd go to the airport we'd fly to the next city and then we repeat that and I remember uh my brother who has had more energy than I did is like hey let's go to the Great Barrier Reef I'm like ah, I'm good I don't want to go <laughs> because I'm I'm just tired like I, I don't I don't have I just don't have the energy to see like I would just be grumpy that entire time right and so it's not some of that stuff's not glamorous when you know when you're going to work right like and that's the perception is you know i'd be speaking in five different cities and every night the group would say like hey do you want to come out for dinner and i'm like that's like not healthy it's not like if you were working every week and you went out for dinner and drinks every night probably not a you know probably have a problem a little bit right so i think it goes back to like that the idea of like the grass is always greener but mm -hmm. actually sometimes it's not and i think like that's like but it also it can be, you know, like yeah. I've, I, I wanted to go away. And at the beginning, because I was only like 21, I was like, oh, I've just got to teach and I need to live my life. And I was going away more to like run away, not run away from right. problems, but kind of like I wanted to go away for the experience of because I didn't know if this was all I, I could do in life. But our move then from New Zealand to Japan was actually intentional, not running away. It was like we want to experience something else mm -hmm. and we are enjoying our life and we're really happy. It, it made me really appreciate my time in London because I, I, I had so many good, amazing opportunities there 
which I didn't really appreciate that I had. Do you know, mm-hmm. it makes you, right. if you go away from somewhere, like, like right. you said before about the helicopter, like you can look over your life and be like, oh, I actually did have a good thing going there. And like, yep. it was way better than what it was, but moving away from it makes you see that. Right. And, um, and yeah, so there's, there's, there's pros and cons. I, I love the fact that I've been traveling. And even though there is pro- cons along with it, I think the experience that I'm having, I'm so grateful to be able to walk around Japan and Tokyo. And like, even whenever we were on our holidays at the Christmas, I was like, we're going back to our life in Tokyo. Yep. It's not like we're going back to like, we can just go and experience that as well. So if I, if I, I think people have to see why they're moving. And I would say to anyone, I would definitely say, try it. If they're worried about traveling, if they're worried about missing home, I would say, yes, that is a big part of it. That's a big, big, mm-hmm. like my grand, like when we talked about it, my granddad passed away whenever I was in New Zealand and my dog passed away. Mm-hmm. And that's a really big negative to be in a way, because right. especially in New Zealand, it takes like two planes to get back. So you can't just pop back and support your family. Yeah. Um, but there's also ways around that to like build those connections. And I have, I've actually had more intentional conversations with my parents and my family because of the time is precious. Like yeah. I want to, I want to get rid of all the angst and all the, all the, the problems that you might have because like you want to make the most of actually being together. So we've had some serious conversations and some great, great dialogue mm-hmm. because of that as well. Sometimes I feel like if you're together, then you kind of just talk past each other and you don't have those conversations because you're just there. Mm-hmm. But being a way you can have that perspective and, and value what it is. So I think there's yeah, pros and cons to both. It's, it's funny when you're talking about that because um, like I'm the baby in my family and my mom is like, you never call me, you never call me. Like we never talk, right? And I call her and then I'll like, hey, how's it going? She's like, good. I, you know, I'm busy. So I hope you're doing well. <laughs> like, okay, thanks for that 30 yeah. seconds. This is why I don't call. It's because you never want to talk to me. Yeah. And, and it's like, but there with, with my, and I, I don't know, um, if this is just like a me thing, but she, one of the things I know about my mom is that like, I used to be like sit in the basement kid, right? Like I used to sit in the basement, watch TV and me being at home, sitting in the basement, not even talking to her is like the happiest she is just, just knowing I'm there. Do you know what I mean? And that's like an interesting thing. Cause I'm just, I'm like, uh, I, I, I talk all day and I just, I know this sound is weird for people listening to this podcast, but I'm, I'm kind of introverted in that sense that, you know, I, I don't, and it, I think people have this perception that introverted people can't talk. Right. Where it's actually, for me, it's like, I'm introverted in the sense that when I talk too much, it drains me of energy. Whereas extroverted, you know, a lot of people that are extroverts actually gain energy through, through that, you know, those conversations. Um, speaking of conversations, I want to just, I want to talk about something that was really cool. When I saw you do the empathetic educators thing, I, I was watching some of the podcasts that you were talking and I thought it was like such a cool idea. I really loved it is that you actually took our initial podcast, which I think was probably like 90 minutes long, yeah. right? Right. Like I don't want to talk to me for 90 minutes, so <laughs> I don't know why anyone else would, but anyways, we talked, we, we, you, you took it and then you like broke it down into like little clips and then you, you play it, you would have conversation on it. Like, where did that idea, like, I just love that. I thought it was such a cool thing. Cause I'm really big. Like I actually wasn't really into the idea until I saw it. I'm like, that's cool. I really like how you're doing that because I'm a big guy on like reflection is important, but I think too often we're just like, Hey, let's just jump to the next conversation. Like, let's just go to the next thing. And I just like tell that process. So like, tell us about that process. You have no idea how proud I am to hear that. Thank you very much. George. Yeah, like, it's really cool. Like, it's, like, it's actually really good. Cause like, I would never have thought that I would be on your podcast. I like last year and hearing you say this about my journey. Like, I really on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank I really, I really do appreciate that feedback. Cause I'm, cause yeah, I think again, it goes back to connection for me. I think mm-hmm. whenever I, I was reflecting on, and I really have spent the last four weeks reflecting on what do I want empathetic educators to be like, mm-hmm. I'm really feeling the noise at the minute for all the different, cause we can say whatever we want at the minute. Anyone can say whatever they want. Anyone can do whatever they want. And 
I'm feeling noise. So I've really been reflecting on what empathetic educators actually does. What, right. Why do I want to do it? What do I want to just put my, like you say, I don't want anyone listening to me for an hour. Well, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't want right. anyone listening to me for an hour. Like it's like, mm-hmm. it's just, I don't feel like that would be important, but I wanted people to be talking and reflecting on why we do what we do. That I want people to look inside and say why, because I think that really helped the process really helps me whenever like, I'm recording my sessions and I look back and say, I was intent, I was trying to do that, but actually what the kids were experiencing was this. And like that mirror, like putting that mirror up and saying what's going on is really important. So what I'm trying to do with empathy educators is get people thinking about why, get people thinking about what and questioning, mm. questioning what's, I, lo- I love questioning. Why is, why is, why is the way, the way it is? And I'm encouraging my learners to question me. So why am I doing what I'm doing? And not in a, not in a, not in a angry way or what, what what's going on there mm-hmm. actually facilitating critical thinking is just so important for me for my kids and for just adults in general like I just feel like one of the things I really feel is missing in a lot of media at the minute is just critical thinking why are you thinking and just trying to create conversations what right. I would like to do more of is like you said like I'm finding like-minded people at the minute who think like me but I, what I'm thinking about for empathetic educators is I want to try and find people who maybe don't think like me and understand mm. why goes back to the neuroscience i just love finding about out about people like my favorite part in the world is going to an airport and seeing people walk by where are they going what are they doing what's what's going on for them mm. and the human part of it <coughs> is why 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 do we do what we do and not question other people actually looking inside and saying why am i doing what i do mm. before it's like that idea of don't throw stones in glass houses or right. something isn't it like it's like I feel like everyone looks outside rather than looks, and not everyone, a lot of people can look outside and not look inside. So I'm trying to have more conversations like that. So that, that like, as I'm listening to you and I, I, this is, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. And I think we live in a time where people are like expecting like statements out of everybody. And I'm like, Kate, hey, we need to kind of like slow down, get information understand stuff because it like that's one of the things is that it's so quick to be able to like post and i think this is one of the reasons i really like having these conversations is because i was doing you know i was just kind of doing this podcast on my own just doing like a 10 minute reflection and it was like really powerful to have these conversations and it's helped me and i think the pendulum has swung uh into such a far direction in the sense of we've been telling everyone needs to share their voice everyone I actually like literally did a TEDx talk on the importance of sharing your voice. And there's a little bit of like, ah, like I'm not as happy with that message in the sense that if everybody's talking, who's listening? Do you know what I mean? And I think that to me is like, we have to also learn to like step back, kind of process some ideas, see what's going on, have an understanding of that. And I think that if we're just like, and when you kind of mentioned media, the the standard is not necessarily most accurate now it's first who's first and who's and i i don't know if that's a good thing for education right and i i like i don't know what you because i think when you talk about empathy i think empathy is about under like it, to me it's kind of the um covey seek first to understand before being understood and like do we teach that enough in schools do we model that well, ourselves that's exactly why like i, I think that's why i've taken the four weeks because i'm like empathy literally is I, I personally believe empathy is like needs to be a core thing that people have mm-hmm. like it needs to be and it needs to be intentionally taught I don't know if you can I think maybe people maybe are more susceptible to empathy than not so maybe it takes hard it might take a bit longer for people to understand it but I think empathy literally could unlock I just look at some things that are happening and in the world and just like if empathy was there this wouldn't be happening like mm-hmm. if, if empathy was there then there'd be just so much more trying to understand and that's that's all i'm trying to do with mine is Mm -hmm. i was just having these conversations by myself trying seeking to understand what was going on reading these books and seeking to understand what Mm -hmm. was going on and that's why i started the empathetic educator so i was like what i'm getting and what i'm understanding is just so rich and so important that i just want to share it with some people and if other people find it interesting then great but if not then all i'm doing is still doing the journey that i'm on anyway yeah and i think it's just, I just, I think going back to the empath in me, I feel the feels of people and I'm trying not to 
carry it so instead i'm trying to encourage people to hold people themselves accountable and what can they do for themselves and so the message we have in empathetic educators is our choices have an impact plain and simple our choices have an impact and i feel like our choices to either bring negative energy or positive energy to a conversation has an impact our choices to attack someone versus seek to understand them mm-hmm. has an impact our choices to try to see the world and say is that what they're actually saying versus i know what they're trying to do mm-hmm. has an impact so i'm like it's it's a different way we see going back to perspectives i think perspectives is so important the way you see the world is through your experiences and it's made up of all those experiences that you had mm-hmm. to create the perspective that you currently have but what I would like to see, and I was listening to a podcast the other day, which I really agree with, is I would like to see people understand that what you think right now doesn't make, doesn't make or break you. Mm-hmm. It, what you think right now can change. That's like, right. We're trying to encourage growth, but then as soon as that one person makes a statement that might not even be what they said, they get cut. And so like they can't even redeem themselves. Right. They can't say, oh, actually, that, that was what I was thinking at the time. But through this conversation, I've kind of changed my way of thinking. Mm-hmm. That's what we need to be encouraging our learners to do is take this information. Do I agree with it? Mm, yes or no. And then change if we have to or keep mm-hmm. the, keep your current way of thinking. But just canceling people from what they said in one little sentence. Like, I'm pretty sure if you look back at some of my recordings, I might have said something to be like, I meant this, Mm -hmm. but I said this. And Mm -hmm. actually that they don't align with my current way of thinking. I didn't word it correctly or or maybe like, yeah, so it's 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 so important to have those those that way of thinking, too. Well, there I can't the. I can't remember the quote, but it's like intelligence is like is shown in your ability to change. Right into like into like change the way you think. I can't remember what it was. There's there's some quote about that. But while I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about like really kind of that empath- that the importance of empathy. I did this. Uh, there, uh, one of my favorite books of all time is uh, Seven Habits. Uh, Covey and I reference Covey stuff all the time, mm-hmm. and he tells a story about being. I can't remember if it was him or it was like a story he had heard but a basically being like on a subway and there is like a dad and his kids were just like running roughshod over the place and just being super annoying and horrible. And Cubby's like, this is the worst dad ever. Like this, like, can you like not get your kids under control? And so he says something to the dad and the dad says, Oh, like, I'm really sorry. Uh, our, their mom just died and I didn't know how to deal with it. And it just changes perspective. Right. Cause like, he sees a bad parent, but he doesn't see that here's a person who doesn't know how to deal with what's going on because they've just endured a significant loss and trying to figure out how they're moving forward with their children. Right. But we don't like, we don't necessarily seek that story out. Right. We just kind of paint and, and have this connection. And yeah, so I think but, it's but it goes back to like understanding our brain. That's what I've loved. Like that the part of my seat, it's part of my season this year. I'm mm-hmm. going to be looking at a book called cognitive neuroscience. And it's all about neuroscience. I don't know a lot about neuroscience. Mm-hmm. I'm just like learning as I go. And I want to break down the different parts of this book because I want to really, really understand for myself. Again, it's me understanding it, but then helping other people understand what's going on in our brain naturally wants to catastrophize everything. Like it's like it, mm-hmm. it it goes there like our part of our brain that tries to like see it and then jump to a conclusion that that's a part of it. And from what I've seen so far, like in the research and that our brain doing that, it's not bad for us to do that. But then we have to think, is that the truth? Our brain thinks mm-hmm. that and then critical critical thinking about what we're thinking. Like it is very meta metacog metacognition, but it's it, we need to do it. We need to question is that the truth of what we think is the truth? Mm-hmm. You know, like that's actually really important is we can jump to the conclusion because our brain might naturally do that, but then we have to think, is that actually is that conclusion right? Is that conclusion correct and what we're actually jumping to? And then if it's not, or what could be going on instead, like exactly that person. And I, I'm not saying I don't do it. Like, of course, of course I do it. Of course, like my brain naturally does it, but I'm getting better at catching the thought. Like, so it's, it's catching the thought, challenging it, and then creating a new thought if you feel like you have to. Mm-hmm. And that's actually using psychology for people with like depression, things like that, CBT like, training. Mm-hmm. But we can do it in our own thinking as well, catching the thought that we have challenging it is it do we think it's correct do we actually think that or is that something that we're assuming because of our biases because of all these different mm-hmm. things 
and then creating a new thought or saying no but that is something I want to hold for myself and that's what I want to do so it's it's okay to have those initial thoughts but actually what we do with those thoughts are really important do we post them straight away or do we say something about them do we do act on it straight away or do like you said take a step back and think about what we can do with them okay so do you want the mo- I want to give you the do you want the most TMI story ever connected to that <laughs> Go on. it's a very TMI story Go on. it's actually pretty so I so I have really bad anxiety okay so I've had anxiety forever and I read this book and it so helped me is I can't I can't remember what it's called it was like it was like it was called dare it was like it's like d-a-r-e I can't remember right but it's got like these four steps and it just kind of helped me understand that and I understand like how certain because the reason I thought of this is when you're talking about like catastrophic I don't I'm not even say the word but you were just talking about stuff yeah there and so um so it was saying that sometimes when you have anxiety like you have to poop (laughs) so I was like what and it's like it it shows how much it actually affects your body is that basically you are going into like fight or flight and your body is trained to actually like basically deplete itself to lower your weight so you can run away quicker and I was like oh my god that's a thing and I and I never like I know that's like a super like I'm not saying that's happened to me. I'm just saying that it just <laughs> like, pastor. yeah, I'm just, I, I don't know. Bruh. No, that's not me. Bruh. So, so <laughs> that when I read that, I was like, oh, that like, it freaks me out because it realize it, you realize how, how much your thoughts affect your, like how you feel like your physical. Right. So that was that like the worst story ever. Or is that like actually? No, 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 no. no it's it literally. Connects. I thought it was pretty it interesting is. too. It is. It is. It completely connects. But even you understanding what's going on, like if I yes, if that's like understanding what's going on in your body, like yeah. things don't just not don't, don't normally in your body don't normally just happen. Like they yeah. there's things that happen. Like and that's what made me think. Even just thinking about that, is there kids in my class? And even you think I haven't thought about this before, but then I'm like. Is the kids in my class constantly go ask them to go to the toilet? Yeah. Is it because they want to go for a wander? Like yeah. there's loads of kids who yeah. just want to go for a little walk. Yeah. But actually, is there kids who are asking them to go to the toilet all the time? Are they showing other signs of anxiety? Are they yeah. showing other things? Yeah. Like like that brings empathy again towards if we can understand that action and that reaction, then we can have more empathy for our learners in that place. So yeah, thank you for your TMI story. <laughs> for that I'm just I I should have said somebody said. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is all connected. Like it's so. Like I've got this book, and um, and it's uh, like it's it's my favorite book. I literally read it so many times. Second favorite book. Second favorite book. <laughs> I've, had three, I've actually sorry. There is. <laughs> I say favorite book all the time, but actually, there's like a couple of books right. that really, really do mean a lot. And um, and this <laughs> one is is one of them, and it's all about like understanding your chimp. So the chimp paradox, and um, and it's all about understanding that like why our brain jumps to conclusions why our brain like wants Mm. to attack why our brain wants to do all these things and it's it's a hijacking us that's what it talks about is hijacking us and like you say like you're going through anxiety so you Mm -hmm. read that book and um and so like this was because of my first year i was just complete my brain was not my own i was just losing the plot slowly but surely getting migraines i had to go to the doctor because it was the first time i've ever got migraines i was getting them every single week and I was like, migraines are way worse than just a little headache. Like, mm-hmm. I was getting full-blown migraines. And so I went to the doctors and she just said, you have to breathe more. And she was right. I wasn't breathing and that is yeah. what was happening. But she didn't give me any reasoning behind it. She didn't say why why I was, what was connected to the migraines and the breathing. She didn't say what was going on or ask me, why are you getting migraines? Why might you not be breathing? Why might you not have a good circulation going on? So then I was like, I need to go find this out for myself. And that's what, like, that's got me onto this book is The Chimp Paradox mm-hmm. because it shows as in what's going on inside of us. It's a very simplified version. And he, and he does say that. He said it's not completely scientific in some of its regards, but the way it creates little metaphors mm-hmm. that make you understand what's going on inside of you. It's really, yeah, so it's a really, really great book. One, one of, I could, I shouldn't say favorite because I do get to second After favorite, Innovator's favorite. Mindset. Yeah, after the very mindset is like way out there, and then like a couple more books below. <laughs> okay, so I'm like a okay. So let's just get a little personal question before we have to go. Okay, so are you like? Do you watch? Do you watch TV? Are you a TV person? Yes. 
Okay, so when you're in New Zealand, my favorite TV show ever is probably like top five is Flight of the Concords. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Right? It's so funny. It yeah, is it's amazing. So I love that movie. I love, you know, Jermaine and Brett. I love them so much. Okay, so like. Did you so watch like, the other one though? Did you watch the other one um, with about the, fa- the vampires? Yeah, what we do in the shadows. That. No, Flight of the Concords well. is best. Flight of the Concords is like a standard for me because I like shows that are like, hey, we're going to do two seasons and then we're done. Right. Because I think a little bit after that. Okay. So when you, you, when you were in London, okay. So like, what was the show there? What was the TV show that was like UK specific? Inbetweeners is really funny. I don't think it's London specific, but it's UK. Have you ever heard of Inbetweeners? I have. Is there like a, 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 is there like a U.S. like office version kind of thing? I don't think so, actually. I, I, well, I, haven't, I haven't heard of the, the, the U.S. version, but the in between years cracks me up. It's one of those things I've watched. I have watched like over the years again and again. Yep. Um, yeah, the in between years, I would say, is probably the fun, one of the funniest U.K. So, and I love the show. It's where I'm from as well. It's on Netflix, actually. I don't know if you've heard of Dairy Girls. No. Dairy Girls. Oh, shout out to that because I'm from Dairy <laughs> and it's like it's literally Good. so funny. Yeah, it's it's it well, I don't know, it kinda hits home as well. So it's like you really get the nuances. They don't really yeah. sometimes whenever people do a show and you don't really know if it's gonna be the truth of kind yeah. of where you're from. Yeah. And of course it's like it's like exaggerated and things like that, but they done a really good job of making it funny. And it's 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 yeah, it's a great it's a great show. It's on Netflix. It's called Dairy Girls. Okay, um, so yeah. okay, so let's see. I wanna see Okay, what's a Canadian TV show that you know? Do you know any Canadian TV show? Nothing. I thought that is how I met your mother meant to be Canadian. <laughs> There's a Canadian in it. <laughs> okay, I don't know. <laughs> That's very close. I'll take it. I'll take it for an answer. How I met your mother? <laughs> yeah, well, no. There's like the main character is from Canada. I've watched it like I've watched it like twice. I'm not into it. So anything that tells me when to laugh, I I can't watch. Oh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, no, I have You got nothing, that. hey? Have you been to to Canada, United States? It's one of, well, I've been to America. Yeah, I've been okay. I've been to I've been to America. I traveled more there, but I haven't been Where to did America. you where did you go when you were in the US? Well, I don't I camp America. So like where okay. you like go and stay in a camp and then so I don't we done that in New York. It's where my partner actually me and my partner met there and um, okay. and we traveled uh the west coast to yeah. california okay and so okay so now that you are in japan like what's what's like the best thing to do while you're there oh my gosh temples and shrines so there's a place yeah. called kamakura and we went there for new yeah. year's eve and um that's where my favorite place to go just outside of tokyo and um and it's kamakura and enoshima Mm-hmm. And then you can see Mount Fuji from those places. And we went there for New Year's Eve. And because of COVID, like no one's really celebrating going out. Yeah. Um, but here they don't really celebrate New Year's Eve. They go and they um they go to like a temple and they yeah. at twelve o'clock they have like all these lanterns and all these lamps and it was uh it was really you know when you just like have a time and you like feel reflective, you know, like, yeah. like you feel it. It was just so beautiful because they mm. had like the the chimes going on. But they had like all different shrines and all different temples there in Kamakura. It's one of the smallest places in Japan, I think, with the, the amount of um, shrines it has. So Kamakura, just outside Tokyo, it's like an hour away from Tokyo. So that's that's awesome. Place that. Well, hey, I want to just thank you for your time. And I, I, I appreciate the connection and reaching out. And I, I really love talking to you. And I really enjoyed that you got me to tell that story about that book. It's a pretty amazing feat. <laughs> I don't think I've ever said that out loud yet, but also recorded love it love that so case. but that wasn't me that was a <laughs> friend funny. that was uh, i was asking for a friend asking who said that was a yeah. thing yeah so yeah that's important too anyways that's thanks important. thank you so much uh for for being here and uh enjoy the new country you move to in a couple months whatever oh, that yeah. might be <laughs> right because you just kind of move around right anyways hey <laughs> thanks for everyone for listening i hope you have a wonderful day naomi and make sure you connect with naomi you'll see her uh blog podcast and where you can follow her uh in the the com- in the description down below so thanks for being here thank you bye bye <laughs>